Hello and welcome to the Starving Podcast. This is your host, Justin Romare. Now I'd like to go through a little bit of our sponsors here. First is Geno Palette. They're a nutrition company that analyzes your genes and your DNA and tells you precisely how you should eat. This is what we think to be the most customized approach towards weight loss, fitness, as it relates to your nutrition. So get the link in the bio and get 20% off your order with Geno Palette by using code CBG. Our second sponsor is X Endurance. This is the purest supplement company on the market, all third party tested, and they have everything you need, even some of the supplements that we're going to be talking about today, such as vitamin D. Our third sponsor is Perform Sleep. This is the most comfortable bed that I've ever slept on. Feels like sleeping on a cloud, honestly. And it's half the price of those expensive mattresses that they force you to finance at Raymore and Flanagan. So honestly, go to the link in the bio, uh, get $75 off your order using code CBG75. Our fourth sponsor is Dad Bod Fitness Online. This is an elegant solution for, you guessed it, dads and other people that have extremely busy schedules but want to, you know, get more fit. We have a direct relation uh, relationship with them that allows also any Dad Bod Fitness member to get 15% off any of their nutrition coaching through a company called CBG, which I'm the owner. So you could also head over to Consistency Breeds Growth, get your customized nutrition plan, buy your Geno Palette DNA, DNA data, get a performance sleep mattress so that you're sleeping awesome, get your X Endurance supplements, and uh, work directly with Dad Bod Fitness. And there you go, you have the whole package. So today we're going to be talking specifically about the immune system, especially as it relates to particular viruses such as COVID-19. So think of this podcast as part two of COVID-19. And if you missed the first one, go ahead and go back and check that out. It's science. All right, guys, what's up? Woo, woo, woo. Jordan, man, how you hey. doing? I'm, I'm doing all right. It's nice to be nice to be back. I like the I like the dad bod fitness podcast. I thought that was I, I really wish I thought of that name. Such an awesome name. It's uh yeah, they're uh they they killed it. And uh yeah, yeah it's it's Dane Smith, it's Adam Clink, and then it's um it's uh Ben Smith. They uh they have a really good program over there where they're they're helping, you know, in a short time frame help people get in the the workouts that they need, you know, and it, it came at a good time, especially with people being home in quarantine, so Nice. Where's where's our guest today? Zarinka, you're back on yeah, I'm the podcast. Here. I'm here. Yeah, no, no, no. Nice. I'm here. I'm here. I'm listening to two two of you, and yeah, I'm fine. Nice, everybody. Sunday. Uh, we have a guest today. Yeah, we have. Yeah, we. we have, <laughs> oh, she's our she's our second. Well, she's our guest that's been on two times now. So I was gonna say second guest, but that wasn't the second appearance of our doctor in immunology, Doctor uh, Zarinka Oreshkovic, our Croatian friend from the east or the balkans i don't know yeah from from uh, the balkans yeah we're not specifically better. east we are kind of like somewhere in between but we're balkans we're from mordor <laughs> well, that's all right well i got they got viruses there we got they got viruses everywhere even in prague so that, i think oh, that's yeah. what we're gonna be talking about today uh like justin mentioned in the beginning of the show notes that this is kind of part two but no doubt as everybody's getting out of quarantine hopefully wherever you're tuning in from but it's about boosting your immune system so we're going to talk about what the hell is the immune system and uh different things you could start snacking on to kind of help it get nice and happy so you can go out there and catch new things in your summer travels besides covid maybe just like a cold or a rash or something so zadinka i want to give you our first question because mm -hmm. i'm not a, <laughs> i'm not a phd in immunology but what is the immune system and can you maybe expound upon the importance of our immune system well if we take a look and look like immune system is basically our defense mechanism against literally everything so i like to explain it as a little army uh of teeny tiny soldiers that are constantly on alert and they are constantly screening our bodies for anything that can be uh, some kind of invasion, like viruses, bacteria, uh, different dying cells, uh, basically anything that can 
compromise uh, the beautiful state, uh, the healthy state that our bodies are, that our bodies should be at. So, yeah, it's basically a teeny tiny army of specialized soldiers uh, consisting of two basic uh, innate uh, innate soldiers who are the first line of the defense and adaptive immune response, the second line of the defense, which are a little bit more spe specialized. It's like basically like, like like soldiers, you have yeah. a small invasion, a first line comes in, they try to try to deal it, they normally do deal with that. Uh, and then when they cannot deal with that, they actually call for the reinforcement. So like this, this would be this would be basically the explanation of our immune, uh, immune system. It is the most important function our body has, because without immune system, we would be dead within hours of our birth. So nice. uh, yeah, it's it's our personalized army. I like it. So I'm gonna, I'm going to break that down even more. So I'm going to say mm -hmm. that our the first part of our immunity are kind of like the Marines. They go in there first and generally get the job done. Then if it, then if you need something a little bit more specific, like a targeted response, our American mm -hmm. listeners would appreciate that one. That would be kind of like the Navy SEALs, Delta Force, exactly. Green Berets, that so, oh yeah, exactly. Yeah, they are yeah. like like Navy SEALs. That's probably the best uh, comparison so far. I'm just I'm just full of analogies. So you mentioned a healthy immune system. Now mm -hmm. we hear the word uh, about people who are immunocompromised. So could you give mm -hmm. us an example about maybe somebody who is immunocompromised or what that may entail? I my base definition would be something somebody where their immune system isn't functioning correctly. But again, I don't know anything that, about this that stuff. So. Is, that is exactly that. Uh, it's called immunocompromised person or, or it's called also immunodeficiency, where immune system is basically not able to work properly. Uh, it can be literally anything. Uh, it's uh, from, let's say, a person with uh, immunodeficiency that is uh, from birth. There are certain conditions that actually result in, let's say, lack of certain cell types uh, of our immune system. These things are very, very rare. Then can be, for example, people who have cancer, who have HIV infections, people who uh, had transplanta uh, transplantations, so they have to take drugs called <clears throat> immunosuppressors that keep their immune system a little bit uh, lower. Let's say they kind of like control their immune system so, they do <clears throat> so the immu immune system doesn't fight uh, the transplanted organ, for example. Uh, so basically everything that can compromise the immune system in a way, also autoimmune diseases, uh, like mm -hmm. diabetes, uh, like uh, rheumatoid arthritis, like Crohn's, Crohn's disease, uh, multiple scler sclerosis, many, many uh, aut autoimmune diseases. This, every, all of this falls into the scope of immunocompromised, uh, immunocompromised organism or immunodeficiency. Awesome. Nice. So, yeah, so it's like a blanket term, which is very, very broad and uh, there's yeah. a lot of different pathologies to it, but that's a nice... Yeah. Nice yeah, little, basically, nice yeah, basically, yeah, it's basically a huge, very, very broad term, which has several branches and each functions in a, in a different way, but the outcome is uh, the same. The immune, yeah. immune system doesn't function as it, it should. And these people are actually more uh, prone to something that we call opportunistic diseases, opportunistic infections, and they are actually more in danger in times like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. So you, you, you talk about uh, the immune system being suppressed either from immunosuppressants or from mm -hmm. a particular pathology. Uh, but, you know, is there, you know, isn't there a mechanism in the body in which the immune system is sort of uh, overactivated? Or would this be uh, sort of the same thing as people with like, like, like if, uh, like, let's say an organ is uh, for example, rejected in the body. Someone gets a transplant; it's rejected in the mm -hmm. body. Is this is 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 this really what people are describing when they say they have a overactive immune system? Because I've heard something with COVID nineteen where, um, you know, there's something people are you know dying from from COVID nineteen as a result of a overactive immune system. Body the body just continuously uh, fighting the the virus. Uh, yes, it can be. It can be something like that because in these cases, uh, it's the lack of regulation. 
because the immune system also consists of activation and regulation, so it doesn't kill us, because in the moment when we uh, contract a disease, it act activates, and it can literally destroy everything. Uh, in some cases, it can happen, we also, um, well, this is something that's monitored, especially uh, in lung diseases, in lung infections, which uh, where lung tissue is destroyed by uh, reaction of the immune system itself. So yeah, this can happen. Uh, and it's basically the, the lack of regulation. There is no another specified, um, let's say, like division of soldiers who are regulating, who are taming down uh, the reaction so it doesn't uh, end up being counterproductive. Okay, so I'm glad I wasn't making that up then. Great. No, 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 you, you, you weren't <laughs> ma making that up. Yeah, it's, uh, this, uh, this has several mechanisms. Uh, in some cases, especially in the COVID, uh, with, the, with this... Uh, times now with COVID, I've read that it actually is um, connected with cytokines, uh, which are small signaling molecules that are literally like signals, uh, teeny tiny proteins that uh, carry the message. Like, oh yeah, we contracted this and you have to, uh, and they're actually activating immune system specific cells. They're literally saying, oh, you have to act right now like this, in this manner. So this can be also the result. They're literally overreacting. They are panicking too much, and they're actually uh, destroying the tissue around. So this is something that it's very common, and no, you're not making it, making it up. It happens. Awesome. All right. No, thanks for clarifying that, because I know the mechanism of this disease. I think we need to continue to gather information about this, because I oh, think yeah. that's why a lot of people, especially people that are immuno, immunocompromised, are um, you know very, very um, you know frightened uh, by mm -hmm. this virus as they should be, but I think as we start to collect more information, they will we will be able to understand uh, you know how opening the entire society up for everyone um, because these people are not you know expendable you know these people that are immunocompromised mm -hmm. they um, they shouldn't have to stay in their home forever. So the only way that you know they're able to get out in in get back to enjoying their life to the fullest is for us to continue to understand more about COVID-19 and its mechanisms. And I think that that brings us to how we should implement strategies and, um, you know, methodologies to boost the immune system. So mm -hmm. uh, now I'd like to shift focus into how to do that, but I want to stay away specifically from uh, drugs and acute drugs specifically that are going to help once you, you know, once you've already been infected. I want preventative, um, you know, methods of boosting the immune system. Um, that's what I'd like to focus our topic on. Are there any, what, what, what methods do you know that people can do in their daily lives or things that people can take where they can uh, really, you know, improve the immune system to maybe prevent exposure and or the ability of uh, the immune system to fight against a virus like COVID-19? It's mostly vitamins. This is something that's been proven. Uh, I rely on scientific data in these cases, and this is vitamins, uh, specifically vitamin uh, C, vitamin D, vitamin uh, A, and also vitamin E. Uh, so for, well, I would say that the most, most important is vitamin D, uh, which has been found in... Um, the lack of vitamin D is involved in many autoimmune disorders. Mm -hmm. uh, it regulates immune response. And also in upper respiratory infections like this one, uh, it actually activates specific uh, cells called macrophages, uh, which are, I like to call them the devouring cells. They literally eat everything in front of them. And they are the first line of the defense. Uh, so uh, they are vitamin D. Uh, the lack of vitamin D, uh, as I said, has been uh, proven to be uh, involved in autoimmune diseases like uh, diabetes, like rheumatoid arthritis, uh, like uh, multiple sclerosis, and so on. Uh, and it actually maintains the regulation of immune system. This is its main uh, main uh, function. So, in the case of uh, prevention we need to regulate, regulate our immune system and we have to um, boost it in a certain way. So in this case would be vitamin D, uh, which we can get, believe it or not, from the sunlight, sunlight. And this is something that's been 
treated people noticed this uh, when they were treating tuberculosis in uh, the beginning of 20th century. They were putting people like to sit on the sun, so they would soak up the sun, uh, so they would just kind of like feel better, and they actually noticed that these people are actually getting better. So we don't have to show the symptoms. We don't have to be um, infected. We can contract the virus, but not show the symptoms. This is what we discussed last time. Uh, so in these cases, when we don't know if we actually contracted the virus or not, vitamin D is absolutely crucial. Also, vitamin C. People know a lot, a lot about vitamin C. It's basically uh, good for acute phase when we kind of like already feel a little bit sick, but also for the prevention uh, because it actually also activates our innate immune system, the first line of soldiers. Uh, and it's also combined with zinc. Uh, not just vitamin C, but vitamin C combined with zinc, it actually uh, does miracles for boosting our immune system. Also, it's vitamin a... What? Oh, no, I was going to say, you see a lot of those um, mm -hmm. taken together. Like if those uh, fizzy vitamins mm -hmm. they sell in the store, I think it's like emergency or something like that, which uh, we can dovetail nicely into the dose of it. Now, I know a lot of these are, I think, no vitamin C is water soluble. Yeah. I think, is it A, C, and E are water soluble? So D, A, K, and E are fat soluble. Mm -hmm. Yeah. D, A, K, and E are fat totally soluble. Not a, yeah. Totally not a biochemist either. So I, yeah. just, I don't know no, anything no, about this I'm, stuff. I'm also but, somewhere, it's it's a something like what is soluble, but it's not soluble. It's I'm not really yeah, D, D, about it, a, honestly. Yeah, yeah, D, A, K, and E are fat soluble, mm -hmm. um, and particularly D. I, I just wanna, uh, I just wanna piggyback on vitamin D. Mm -hmm. It's, um, yeah, yeah. it's, it's actually, um, you know, from the sun, uh, mm -hmm. UVB radiation or sun exposure yep. is yep. the way that most people are able to uh, get enough vitamin D. But people also supplement with this because if you look at of the darker skin community, they're actually, you know, they have a protective mechanism in their skin, which, you know, prevents them from getting enough sunlight um, because they were, you know, born in an area of, you know, lots of sun. Mm -hmm. So the, it's, it's important for, for, I would say, almost everyone uh, to supplement with uh, vitamin D um, so that, you know, you can do the necessary chemical chemical reactions uh, in the lower layers uh, of the skin, the uh, epidermis. And um, this is um, important, but the, the milligram amounts that uh, people are typically um, looking for, like if you're going to the store, you know, it's a pretty wide range, but I would, I would say around 800 I use a day. Um, and sometimes even upwards of 1200 um, and some studies have shown optimal uh, levels uh, for, for maintenance in the blood so um, yeah that that's that's what I would say is probably the dose that you're looking at for D uh, vitamin D specifically uh, I'm not really like I don't really track my dosages I do what I usually do at the beginning of the winter because winters in Czech Republic uh, Czech Republic are gray 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 no sunshine whatsoever yeah uh, so yeah it's like I always say it's literally a gray zone so by the by the start of the winter which is nearly in October I actually just go to the pharmacy and I pick some vitamin D tablets and I just take them through entire winter. And then when now this lovely spring summer is coming, I'm actually stopping with that because most of, most of the time outside and I also eat a lot of fish. Uh, and it's also what it's really good for uh, vitamin D. This is also what I read in one of the studies. It's cod liver oil. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's... Um, Basically, vitamin D is the most most important one for the maintenance of normal immune system. Uh, so this is why we don't, in this case, we don't get immuno, like, immunodeficient, for example. Uh, if we are going to get immunodeficient in some ways through some other, another disease, we cannot really uh, predict that. We don't know, but it can happen. Uh, but still, our immune system is going to function pretty much normally if we take on our vitamin D. Uh, so I would definitely recommend that one. So yeah, 
through any yeah. way the people actually like it. I mean, for me, pills work the best. Uh, literally, tablets work the best through winter. Yeah, there's mm-hmm. there's a lot of different ways to get it into, and I know um, I was just listening to a nice podcast about pharmacists and how they're the forgotten uh, healthcare administ- healthcare workers. So I think a nice trick would be if if you go some if you have a regular relationship with your pharmacist and they see the other drugs that you're taking it might be worthwhile to have a conversation with them about you know if you if it's right for you to supplement Mm -hmm. vitamin d and they might be able to help you uh determine an effective dosing strategy something you should talk about with your doctor as well um yeah that's true yeah some yeah some of my other clinician friends and they said that sometimes it's people are getting enough most of the times that's not the case but the the level of, that you should be supplementing at to get to that uh, it could be tested with the blood. There's some problems with that test, but that's a complete. That's like really deep in the weeds. We don't need to talk about. But my nursing friend said that if you're going to be, you know, if this is something that you know that there's a deficiency and it's pretty much assumed that there is, just take enough and, and talk to some healthcare provider, and they can steer you in the right direction. And I think a pharmacist would be, especially because a lot of people are on you know, different meds that will sap different uh, minerals out of you anyway. So it's a good consideration to think about. Yeah, but this, like taking this type of supplements is definitely uh, something that should be done uh, with, you know, you you have to consult with someone who knows something about it, you know, prior to actually deciding and start taking it. So yeah, pharmacists, I mean, I'm also consulting my pharmacist all the time on these things. So. I like it. So I think that the next thing uh, I think we should talk about are two of our favorite things on the podcast. Let's talk about exercising and sleeping. Um, Mm -hmm. Does anybody want to take this one up about how both of those are absolutely crucial for your immune system, especially sleep? Yeah, I can start with the exercise. At least, you know, (laughs) I mean, we're finding out now, um, you know, that there are people with particular comorbidities that are affected just in our specific case. Um, with the current situation with COVID-19, not only are they, um, you know, more likely to get infected, they're more likely to, um, you know, die as a result of, of COVID-19. Um, and I think we briefly talked about this last, last time uh, mm-hmm. we spoke, but, um, you know, basically y- your body spends, uh, especially if you're uh, overweight um, or have Um, you know, other types of diseases, your body spends a lot of time, um, and specifically maybe the immune system in this case, uh, fighting, you know, that battle as opposed to battles such as, you know, the interaction with viruses, at least that's, um, a sort of a general, um, not, not a, a very detailed explanation of, you know, how exercise in particular, uh, can help now the acute effects of exercise on this, I'm, I'm not as familiar with. So like how you could, you know, if you started working out at the beginning of, you know, um, this whole uh, pandemic occurring, that you could prevent yourself or, a lot, uh, you know, give your body the resiliency to be able to fight off COVID-19. That I'm unsure of, so. Well, there are so many mechanisms and so many um, studies actually uh, done on, uh, well, based on, uh, uh, well, exercise and immune system, how they actually work together. And yeah, absolutely, uh, exercise is crucial. First of all, I would just go back to uh, body fat. Uh, it's mainly visceral body fat uh, that is um, in, involved in inflammation processes because people who are a little bit on a uh, bigger side uh, who actually have uh, a lot of body fat, they also have a lot of visceral body fat, which is a source of inflammation. So when we start exercising, we start losing fat and we reduce the inflammation that is inside our body. So you were absolutely right. Instead of fighting something else, the body is actually fighting the fat. And this visceral fat is around the organs specifically. Yeah, this is, this is specifically the visceral fat that is around the organs and it's actually source of uh, inflammatory signals for our body. So it puts our body into inflammatory state. Uh, so it's in a state of uh fighting basically so instead of just uh f- the body cannot focus in that way uh to something else like let's say a virus because already has one battlefield 
Makes if sense. You, yeah, yeah. So it's it's basically this uh, this how how uh, excessive body fat uh, influences our immune system. So yeah, uh, when it comes to acute exercise, it actually works in two different ways. It's generally what is mostly studied is the way that how it actually affects the innate immune system, the first line of soldiers, and it's actually boosting it. It's literally boosting it in a way that we uh, cannot even imagine. Uh, it's uh, enhancing the ability of our cells, specific, specific cells called neutrophils. Uh, it's, uh, they're phagocytes. They also eat everything in front of them, basically. Uh, so they are very much increased after exercise, after acute exercise. Uh, then also it um, increases the numbers of uh, natural killer cells, and which are also the part of our innate immune system, which are cytotoxic cells, which are actually killing the infected cells. And this is something that is important in, for example, cancer. Uh, some newer therapies are focusing or N on NK cell boost therapies for fighting cancer. So in the case uh, when we're exercising and they're boosting, the numbers are boosting up, we are actually increasing our uh, body's ability not just to fight an viral infection because NK, uh, NK cells will kill uh, the infected cell uh, as well, but they will also kill potential uh, tumor cells. So in some novel studies, uh, exercise is a, a part of tumor um, fight, let's call it that way, tumor treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, then what uh, it boosts also specific T cell response, which is uh, another set of cells which uh, are the part of our uh, uh, adaptive immune response. And they're actually crucial for uh, elimination of bacterial, uh, uh, bacterial and viral infections in our bodies. So technically what we can say that, yeah, exercise puts us, puts our body and our immune system in a little bit better prepared state to fight any potential infection. So even if we have, let's say, a mild infection that you're not really aware of, and we start exercising, we can actually help our body to fight it off. Mm -hmm. And we can actually just literally walk it off without knowing. And this is what's happening with people that, you know, aren't, you know, showing any symptoms or asymptomatic, potentially. Could be. Could be one one part of it, yes, because uh, could be. Uh, I would have to really test this to say, mm -hmm. yeah, this is actually true. But yeah, this is one of one of the possible explanations. Yeah, yeah. You said something also with the you know how to improve the the function of T cells. I think that this is also related to um, sleep. They they have mm -hmm. studies that show that the um, their large um, improvements in the uh, function and operation of T-cells as a result of a good night's sleep, which I know, Jordan, you were asking about fitness and sleep. So I think that, um, you know, just generally, that's at least what I've seen in the literature. Yeah, that's that's one thing. And I know that the lack of sleep, too, is a, the easiest way to keep your body in, in, in a per persistent state of inflammation. So if yeah. nothing else, the sleeping can cause you, you know, systemic inflammation as opposed to you know like localized inflammation say if you just from exer like exercise stress in the muscles or something like that the good inflammation yeah yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not yeah. i'm not the best person to talk about sleep because my sleeping patterns are pretty much non-existent same <laughs> same yeah. yeah yes yeah it's getting better now but yeah when i was i was uh, finishing my thesis and when i was working uh, when I first started to work on, on my, my thesis, I wasn't sleeping at all. And yeah, it's been haunting me since then. So yeah, I'm not the best person to talk about sleep, but hey, let's try. So yeah, there are some studies, as you said, they are actually improving T cells, uh, T cell function and also sleep deprivation in itself. Uh, sleep, any kind of dis sleep disturbance uh, that can be caused, for example, by stress, by anxiety. Uh, or short sleep, um, people who are sleeping instead of, let's say, normal. Generally, we say like eight hours, but I think that definitely depends on people, on person. I'm able to sleep once when I get to it. I'm able to sleep 12 hours in a, like one piece. Uh, so it can also lead to chronic low-grade inflammation, which is not so. It's constant elevation of pro-inflammatory cytokines in our body, which can be, uh, any, which as I said, these are these signaling molecules. They're signaling 
our body to fight. So they are generally activating either cells, uh, either T cells, so they're constantly activated and in start in a state of um, fight, uh, or actually they're prepared, they're not fighting, but they're prepared to, instead of just being nicely uh, regulated and being nicely in the call of, let's call it rest state, so they can just activate when they're needed, they're constantly activated. So this can lead to the different kinds of uh, problems. For example, even if even uh, to some sort of um, it has been linked also to some uh, autoimmune diseases where body actually attacks itself, uh, mm -hmm. or also the recovery, also the wound recovery, for example, has been ex uh, has been uh, studied in relation to sleep. So when we're not sleeping enough, our body is not recovering enough our body cannot really uh, produce, um, cannot really, uh, cannot really, yeah, cannot, ca cannot properly recover, cannot really uh, induce all those mechanisms that are uh, involved in wound recovery, in uh, healing. So the same thing is uh, for fighting the disease, because when we need to, when we need to uh, be let's say we're sick and we need to recover we also need to be in this recovery state we need our recovery state so we need sleep for this to actually allow our body to recover and we cannot do that if you're not sleeping enough yeah yeah i think um that, that that's important so fr from that we know that um a healthy balanced diet we know um you know fitness mm -hmm. uh working out um a healthy balanced diet with vitamin d fitness, sleep, and then also, you know, there, there's a lot of buzz out there about, um, you know, heat and cold. And I think, um, you know, like taking ice, ice baths and also uh, even cold showers, um, at least a, a simplistic mechanism that, I, that I've, uh, I haven't read any studies on, but that, that I know is uh, that, you know, when you're taking a cold shower, your body struggles uh, to stay warm. So your metabolic mm -hmm. rate increases. And then from there, uh, the body produces more white blood cells because it thinks yeah. your body's like sort of like under attack, you know, so it's like protecting itself. And therefore, this mechanism as a result of increased white blood cells increases the or boosts the immune system. Um, is that is that something that's like is that something that's beneficial for people to try to boost their immune system? Uh, I honestly haven't found anything that I can really rely on, like scientific study that can actually um, back this up. Yeah. Uh, so I would say if they find it that actually works for them, yes. I mean, cold showers, uh, ice baths, definitely not something that I would do. Nope. Honestly, I hate I hate cold, <laughs> and it's it's a no for me because you know during the winter I would rip up my radiator and carry it on me all the time. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I mean, technically, the, yeah, it increases the blood blood cell count, so it does increase the yeah, but because white blood cells are the cells of the immune system. So yes, in the short term, this could work. Uh, as I said, as simply as in a in a let's draw a parallel with exercising. When we are exercising, our blood cells uh, count is also increasing. So yeah, we can maybe kill something that we contracted and we don't know. So in this case, yes, if it's uh, boosting the white blood cells yes why not they can do it something that i wouldn't do like right. no way <laughs> but uh and i really haven't found anything that i can say yeah this was backed up by science uh so i would uh leave it in a way of you know in the gray area of natural medicine open-ended yeah yeah open-ended and i wouldn't put it in the, the same basket as homeopathics but it's something right. that can Something that can help, yes, but I'm not really, um, I'm not really convinced. You got to be doing everything else with the diet, yes, the vitamin exactly, D, exactly, everything else, exactly. and then if you want to supplement in cold showers and um, yeah, if if something that's if someone, a one finds exciting, why not? Like in, in any way, yeah, it can help. But exactly as you said, with everything else, with uh, proper supplement, supplement with exercising with proper diet yes absolutely yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. why not and this and this also no yeah. from my point okay gotcha and this also brings up heat you know so like mm -hmm. there are a lot of people that are like you know doing sauna sessions and heat i mean when you're exercising your internal body temperature increases mm -hmm. right and 
But we also know like when you're sick and you run a fever, right? Like this is an adaptive immune response, right? Yeah. The, the fever is associated with uh, a cell signaling molecule, plays a role in influencing, you know, uh, an effective immune response as a result of, you know, whatever sickness you have. But as a preventative therapy, um, I know that there's also buzz around the generation of heat shock proteins. And if they're getting mm -hmm. to a high enough temperature, is this something that people should look into on the opposite end as opposed to cold, but heat as a, as a, a remedy for, um, boosting the immune system? Uh, yeah. Also, yeah, I mean, this is something that I found it's beneficial. It's done, uh, studies have been done in terms of car uh, cardiovascular diseases because it actually uh, dilates, uh, heat dilates our um, vessels, blood vessels. Mm -hmm. So in a way, yes, uh, it increases the blood flow. So uh, as the proper signaling between uh, immune cells also relies on uh, lymphatic system and actually on the flow on the, on or of our lymphatic system and our blood flow, uh, then in this case also, yes, why not? I mean, it can help when in combination with everything else. Also not something that I actually found like a proper evidence that I can say, yes, this has been backed up again by science. If somebody finds it, I would like to read it. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But I personally haven't found it. Uh, but yeah, I mean, in a way, yes, it can help. Uh, it can boost the immune system. It, as you said, increases the body temperature, which also signalizes is in a way of, yeah, we have, to we have to boost now to our immune cells. We have to work now. So in a way, uh, so we can also, again, fight something inside our bodies. So I would say... Also to this, yes, if somebody finds it fun. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Because these, these two things, yeah, I really haven't found something that I can really back up and say, yeah, science has a proper, strong evidence on this. Uh, when I find it, I will let you know. But yeah, up to now, I would, I would keep it as something that's, yeah, somebody finds it fun. Uh, somebody wants to do it. It can help. It's not going to do anything bad. But how it is going to really, like, what it really does, it's somewhere still in the shades. Awesome. Okay. Well, that, that's a lot of different strategies to boost mm -hmm. the immune system. Um, I think that, you know, we wouldn't have done this podcast if COVID didn't happen. So, like, or maybe we would have gotten to it at some point. So, like, this is shedding light on the fact that it's bringing about awareness to us to actually inform people about this. But we also want... Um, you know, people to do their own self-awareness and yeah. determine, you know, what they need to do to take care of the one body that they have. I mean, guys, it feels great. Like I've done the ice baths before. After you get out, you feel amazing. I've done the, the sauna session before. They feel amazing. I've, I've taken care of my nutrition, taken in the right amount of vitamin D. I get an adequate amount of sleep. Um, I try to work out five to six times a week, even if it's at low intensity you will not know what good feels like until you're you're doing those things. Um, and we hope that um, as a result of COVID-19 and, and, you know, some of the results and the statistics that have come out that people do decide to, you know, take part in, in taking care of themselves a little bit better. And hopefully uh, this podcast provided some insight into how to do that and get people moving because it honestly just starts with, one meal the yeah, one exactly. meal just one meal have it make it a healthy meal and then go from there and start on you know your new journey uh generally i would actually also add just some uh instead of just just vitamin d which is important i would also add vitamin c and vitamin a into this group because they both also play a very significant role in our immune system and its uh, normal function and also what i hear a lot is that it's one of the myths that has been debunked that um, acute exercise, especially in terms of, for example, CrossFit, because we all do it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very acute. We all know that. Uh, it's very vigorous. Uh, and people say that it actually vigorous uh, exercise can um, lower our ability. It can actually uh, lower our, uh, our immune system which is actually not true. They have, it's, uh, puts, um, they say it puts in the state of lymphopenia, 
which means that our peripheral blood cells, like white blood cells, are uh, the numbers are decreased. And uh, what what is the common myth? This is the common myth. So they usually say that due to this lymphopenia, we have this uh, opportunistic window, which uh, we are in infected uh, infection risk. Uh, greater infection risk after the exercise. This is not true. Our blood blood cells, uh, our immune system is from the blood, from peripheral blood, how we call it, is actually moved into the tissues. And it actually gets back to the blood within six to 24 hours post exercise. Uh, so we can actually call it some, some kind of immunosurveillance. It's actually a heightened state of immunosurveillance and regulation of the immune system. So that means that instead of just being in the blood, our blood cells are actually out there and looking for some kind of some kind of infection that may come in. Mm. Yeah, if that's super it, interesting. Yeah, this is something that I hear a lot. Oh, no, you're exercising too much. You shouldn't exercise now. You're going to be sick. No, on the contrary. Wow. Nice. Yeah, so definitely get over to Dad Bod Fitness. Get your online program. Let's go. Time to get uh, Time to get fit. Uh, time to get your diet in check. Um, Jordan, you have anything else, my man? Uh, stay moving. It's hard. I get it. A lot of things that we've talked about today, if you know the, the ice bath, if you're a maniac and you want to do that, it's all <laughs> about that de-stressing and relaxing game. If your relaxing game is strong, go work out, bust your ass in the gym, come home and just chill. That's going to be so much, so much better for you yeah. as a nice healthy long-lived person so just get after it Let's definitely do it. all right drink it thank you so much for coming on to the podcast today and giving us all of this um really great credible information and really um you know uh sifting through the uh the literature for us so that everyone uh, doesn't have to go out and try to read this um we we really appreciate it and thank you for coming on the, the starving podcast you're welcome. Oh yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, and I mean, reading reading something like this, it's not easy. <laughs> Sometimes it's confusing for me as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because yeah, so scientific papers can be. Ah, oh, we have a lot of information, so instead of just making it simple message, let's complicate it as much as we can. So yeah, uh, reading about immunity. Hashtag immunity science. Is, 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 yeah, hashtag science. So yeah, yeah something that. I think this is. Uh, yeah, I think this is kind of crazy that. Um, and this is just a last note before we take off, guys. But there are people online on Facebook that are claiming that they've read studies and do, like to be honest. Um, look, guys, don't even get me started. Yeah, I, you're you're no, not. No. Look, uh, <laughs> you're you're not. Um, you're you don't have the tools necessary to be able to even read an article, um, oh, yeah. and and be able to decipher through it, and then much less get onto Facebook or another social media platform with bandwidth and provide the the summary of what you think that the article said. Like if you didn't go to higher level ed education, like past a batch, bachelor's degree, um, like a master's degree or a PhD, um, you know, some medical doctors, um, you know, even don't, you know, they, they, they can and they do read studies, but it, it really takes people that are extremely knowledgeable in how to even pick apart a study to know whether it's some people don't even know if the study they read is peer reviewed or not. Um, uh, so please, if you're doing this and you want to read for your own education and you want to ask people questions, that's fine. But yeah, you, you don't even really, um, you don't even, I don't even know why you have access to peer-reviewed journal articles to be completely honest uh, pointless doesn't, call yeah, shots doesn't, yeah does, doesn't really have to be peer-reviewed uh what i found um very interesting is uh nature and science have the their peer-reviewed uh, journals we all know that nature and science yeah but they also have the web pages in which they summarize most recent um studies in a normal language, uh, as one of my friends called it, called it like peasant language, which I love so much because um, he read one of these scientific articles and he just looked at me and said, like, can you please translate this to the peasant language uh, so I can understand it. So I just referred him to these pages. So it's Science and Nature. They have really lovely summarizations of the most recent studies and everyone who knows how to read can understand them. I'll just save everybody a lot of time. Vaccinate your kids, eat something good, and uh, climate change is real. That's all. That's all. And my podcast on.
Sorry, Boom. And the, uh, and the flat is not earth, uh, the earth is not flat. There's not a wall ice around the Antarctica doing a PhD <laughs> on that. I found it already. All right, let's get out of here. I'll talk to you guys later. <laughs> Thank you guys. And uh, we'll see you guys next time. Bye. Bye-bye.